it's not very long. <laughs> okay, what's going on? How's everybody doing? I'm Luke Agrippa. I'm a software engineer and researcher at Coalition, where we sell cyber insurance. Uh, I spend most of my time analyzing vulnerabilities and adding them to our fleet of honeypots, as well as researching how we can leverage uh, large language models and build some cool insurance applications. This is my first time at DragonCon, so I'm super excited to be here. Hi, I'm Steven Krauss. I am a physical and digital penetration tester and security engineer. I work for an automotive firm, uh, but I do a lot of consulting. Uh, that includes a lot of breaking into buildings and sometimes breaking into their networks as well. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about is, a, just to get you in the mindset, how many of you guys have free credit cards with the RFID on it? Come on, tell me. I'm not going to steal it, I promise. How many of you guys have digital locks on your house or have a badge kind of like this to get into your office? Oh, Any office. I bet a lot of you do. This is exactly what this is for. Now, the Flipper Zero is a cool little device. It came out about two years ago. Um, primary purpose was it's basically a general uh, wireless and uh, wired hacking tool. It does a lot of various things. It's not really a replacement for some of the specialty tools. Like I have a tool called Proxmox, which is made specifically for stealing badges. It can do it from a little further away. But nonetheless, we're going to talk a little bit about what the Flipper Zero is. And we actually have a couple uh, standing up here. His has the cool card. I didn't bring mine, so I'm a loser. <laughs> so. But yeah, it's basically a digital multi-tool. And here I have a little Wi-Fi development board on top, so we can do some Wi-Fi hacking as well. Cool stuff. So let's kind of go over what is inside this little thing. Inside this guy is a little software-defined radio for sub-gigahertz, 300 through 928 megahertz. That covers a lot of things like your car keys, or if you have little wireless remotes for uh, opening your door, the garage door openers, a lot of them are sub-gigahertz. Uh, it has a 125 gigahertz low-frequency radio RFID. Uh, it, those little badges like you've got for your room, probably, or that. <coughs> Uh, yeah, if you want to get into a parking garage and the gate's blocking you, I want to get one of these. Never done it. But <laughs> it has a 13.56 megahertz, which is the most common one that you'll find for things like uh, your credit cards or the, the cards for your office. Now, what this can't do is some of these cards are a little more advanced. Like, this card will respond on the same frequency that it's powered up and scanned on. This one will power up, but it responds on a different frequency to make it harder to do that. Proxmox can do that. This guy can. His radio is a little more limited. But since this is kind of a grab bag of all those different tools, it's kind of an, a way for you to kind of experience the various tools that hackers might have access to. <clears throat> yeah, one, one way to describe this is really a digital multi-tool. And while well, if you were a penetration test, you probably wouldn't use this. Probably. This kind of it's a fun way where you can learn more about it and it's kind of really brought awareness to radio frequency hacking because it's super prevalent in our lives, but people don't really know how vulnerable they are. Also, as infrared, I can annoy people and turn off all the TVs in the doctor's <laughs> office, which they usually like because it's playing some home makeover thing which no one wants to watch anyways. Um, it also has uh, iButton Read, which you probably won't see a lot of, but if you're ever walking around a mall or an office and you see a little what looks like a dime stuck to up the wall, that's probably an I button. So a lot of uh, physical security teams, they will go around and they have to manually scan those as they're going around the building to verify that they're doing their route. This you can scan and sometimes you can read things that are on them. So you can identify routes, identify things about what they're doing. And that was kind of one thing that was cool is not a lot of tools have that ability, but this one does. You can see that's right on the bottom over here. I've also heard this is much more, did you say it's already prevalent in like Europe as well? These eye buttons are kind of everywhere. Yeah, they have the eye buttons at my office and our security guys have. They have like a little tool that they go up and it contacts it and it just basically checks a box. Um, but there are more advanced ones. Uh, used to be when you uh, got certified in Java programming, they'd send you a little ring that had a little chip in it that you could read with this, which was a little eye button thing. I still have one of them I got off eBay. Um, 
But getting into some of the cooler things this can do, bad USB. So bad USB is a tool that I actually use every time I do an engagement. We take a USB drive, we flash it as to appear as a HID device, like a keyboard or something, and it basically starts sending commands to the computer into PowerShell or Command Prompt or if it's a Linux box, into something like Bash. And it'll start trying to run things that uh, looks like the user's typing it, but it's really just the USB doing it. Yeah, so there's not that many security controls set up for when you're using a keyboard, because the computer kind of just assumes you have privileges to use that computer if you're there with the keyboard. So you can really do some cool things when you plug this in and use the bad USB functionality. You write little scripts, you plug it in, it starts executing whatever script you've selected. Uh, there's a, oh, what is that one tool? It's annoying. The, is it Bunny? The rubber, rubber Ducky. Ducky. Rubber, yeah, rubber Ducky. Rubber Ducky. And there's, there's another one made by the, the guys who make a lot of the hacking, uh, hacking tools. Um, oh, you Bad Bunny? Bash Bunny? Bash Bunny. Bash Bunny does a lot of the same things. So you can actually go up and you can scroll up and down, select the script you want to run based on what the computer, is the computer locked? Is it unlocked? Is it Windows? Is it Linux? I want to run this script because so, I know it will specifically target whatever that's supposed to do. So that is one of the cool features. This will also do things like uh, you can emulate a YubiKey with this and actually do a lot of the functions. If you don't know what a YubiKey is, it's basically a little USB multi-factor device. Some of them have NFC where you've got to scan it through your phone. Some of them have fingerprint where you can actually press your finger into it and it'll unlock your computer or it'll allow you to use a token. Yeah, since you can do the HID emulation too, you can use this as a mouse jiggler. <laughs> yeah, if your uh, email or something turns off and goes to sleep when you're not moving the mouse too often, you can plug this in and it'll... Yeah. And I do digital forensics, so sometimes we get a criminal's computer where the computer might lock at any time. We actually have mouse jigglers that are specifically designed just to keep the computer unlocked so that we have time to move it somewhere where we can do forensics on it, or at least maintain control of the device without uh, using it. A little backstory on that, there was a hacker who was actually caught, he had a USB where if the USB unplugged it would lock his computer. The FBI faked a lover's quarrel behind him and then had someone come up and grab the computer away from him and hold on to the USB key so he couldn't log out. So that's one of the things kind of you can do with it. So this kind of goes more into the physical hardware. Inside is a little STM32 uh, ARM chip. Uh, pretty decent processor. Now, when you think of a microcontroller, microcontrollers are different from the CPU that's in your phone or your computer. Your phone or your computer has an operating system on it. This kind of has an operating system, but it doesn't have Linux or Windows or anything like that. It has something called Real-Time OS, which is really just a task scheduler. It's just basically organizing the thing, the, the language or the programming that it has to execute at any one time. Because microcontrollers don't have a way to do that on their own. They have to have something else come in and do that for them. We also have these GPIO pins on top. That's actually how this Wi-Fi development board is plugged in as well. And I can't see the picture. Okay. Okay, just. So going back into the kind of software that's on this thing. So we have real-time OS, it's a C++ module made to run on microcontrollers. Uh, and you basically have what's the stack of this thing, which you have your services and applications, basically like the cute little flipper that shows up on there, that's one of its services. Uh, you have these core programs that run things like radios, run the Bluetooth, run uh, all the various things that it needs to talk to at any one time. Because it only has one core, it's got to schedule who's going to get that CPU time at any one time. Like, I want to go scan a batch. Okay, you get pushed up to the front. It's your turn to run whatever language you've got uh, in order to do that. Yeah, they also have a uh, desktop application and a mobile app as well where you can go in, you can do over the air updates via Bluetooth or USB. And you can also, I mean, one of the things that they have as well is the default kind of firmware that this comes with is limited. So they have these like hacked firmwares that people have published online. You can download from GitHub and go check out and get some added functionality. And if you're running bad USB, you can actually set up the application to communicate to it and tell it what script remotely you want to do. 
which is one thing that USB, if you plug in a USB drive, you don't, you might not know what it's going to run. But if you can actually go plug that in, walk away somewhere else, and start executing your scripts remotely, cool. You've got a way to not be in the range of the crime that you're committing, and be able to actually see feedback. You know, technically not crimes if you're doing a pen test as long as it's within scope. Yeah, these, these are all hypotheticals. Yes. <laughs> Do not commit crimes. You will get in trouble. So, he kind of already went into that, but he can cover, maybe you want to demo what the Wi-Fi board does. Yeah, absolutely. So, we can flash um, a different type of firmware on this Wi-Fi development board. It's called Wi-Fi Marauder. And then it actually comes in with a bunch of built-in different attacks that you can run. There's something called um, Evil Portal, where I believe this you can use a deauth attack to knock somebody off their Wi-Fi. Then you can set up another Wi-Fi network with the same name. So when they go to try and reconnect, they'll end up connecting maybe to yours. And once they do, you can have a, a portal there where you can actually emulate like, I don't know, Amazon login or banking login or something, and they'll go and maybe put their credentials in and there you go, now you have them. Doing so, a minute in the middle attack. Yeah, basically. Another thing that's kind of fun that I actually want to show you guys here is called a beacon spam attack. So I can actually, using the script that I wrote, I can actually like, if you guys want to, this is Check probably, phones. yeah, pull out your phones <laughs> and um, you can go to the Wi-Fi network and see what and see what networks are available. And one of them should be Dragon Con. There should be multiple, different numbers. With the four is the A, the zero is the O's, and some underscores. But yeah, so you can you can just like throw up tons and tons of Wi-Fi networks and just kind of like overflow people's. You can do a denial of service attack. So if you have a Wi-Fi that you want to keep people away from, you can basically spam that and spam one that looks legit and do that man in the middle attack. Uh, exactly. So the other thing about deauth attacks is every time you get deauthorized or disconnect from the Wi-Fi, even if you already have the password saved, it has to re-authenticate to the access point. To do that, there's a little bit of basically the passphrase that gets passed back to it. So if you do multiple deauth attacks against a Wi-Fi device, it's going to pass a couple of those every time. Now, if you collect enough of them, you can actually get the full hash and start cracking that hash and discover what the password is. This is one of the reasons why when you're on Wi-Fi, especially in a place where you don't control or know, you should be wary of whether you have HTTPS enabled on your browser and that you have a good certificate because what they may try to do is once they know that passphrase, they'll set up another access point, try to get you to go to that one, and then sniff whatever credentials you're sending to it. Any yeah, good question? Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if that applies to all like current um, what is it, uh, security mechanisms on Wi-Fi, because I know some older ones are definitely vulnerable. To Web is super, uh, so uh, back in the day, when <laughs> Wi-Fi first came out, you had what was called WEP, yeah. which and that's is, obviously, yeah. yeah, WEP is deprecated, but you will find them around because people don't upgrade very often, or sometimes they have legacy equipment that must use older protocols like WEP because they don't support what is most commonly now WTPA 2 and 3. Is 3 now they're up to? Um, WPA3 is the one that just came out effectively. Um, WPA2, you can still sniff the key, but that just gets you on the network. So if you deauth someone enough and get enough of the hash, you can then send that to something that will run a dictionary attack against the hash and hopefully be able to get you the actual passphrase. Yeah, there actually are some new protections as well against these deauth attacks where it won't actually kick you off the network unless... I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it works. You have to send some sort of encryption. So with new multi-radio systems, if you get deauth on one radio, it might just switch you over to another. So the big thing is a single radio can only do one thing at any one time. It can only transmit or receive. Now, you might notice this when there's a lot of people on Wi-Fi. Suddenly the Wi-Fi gets really slow because every person on the Wi-Fi gets given a time slot where they're allowed to communicate and then receive data from the access point. 
The way we've solved that is by having more than one radio. This used to be called MIMO back in the day. Uh, and if you buy a new router, you might see something on the router that says 3x3 three three or 4x4. Four four. That is the number of radios that it has to listen and receive at any one time. The more radios you have, the more often you can do it. So in order to prevent D off attacks from working, what it does is basically we'll start switching the radios and say, oh, you got D off on that radio. It's okay. This radio over here, he picked you up. You're still authenticated. Your session is still valid. Don't worry. That helps protect against some of that. There are other things like uh, there's transport level mechanisms that can basically go, oh, by the way, you already had a session, so I'm just going to resume our network connection, and you don't really have to re off. I know who you are. I see your MAC address. I know you're supposed to be here. Would that also be true for mesh systems? Yeah. Mesh systems get a little weird because in most cases, mesh might not be doing authentication. Some mesh does where it's like you have either a shared key that you're doing, a pre-shared key, a PSK, or you might have uh, even a tokenization system. Uh, I know for ESP32 devices, which is a microcontroller I develop with, you can actually set a token that the whole mesh system will exchange and uh, while you can capture it if you get enough of the information, uh, it's still harder because they're all kind of mixing that up in the middle with each other. Feel free to ask questions, guys. You know. So now we get into more about what, what can you do? Like, okay, this is cool. What do we do with this? Like, great. So we went into, so the U2F, that's what I was talking about with the YubiKey, that is an authentication device that's over USB. Um, you're going to be seeing a lot more of this stuff in the future because a lot of companies are starting to move to this. Rather than you having a username and password to log on your system, you just have a token. Or you just have a device like Multifactor that just generates a random password that you have to put in every time. So you don't have to memorize that password anymore. Or maybe you don't even have to type in a password. You just press a button on your phone or your token, and it logs you in. Yeah, we also spoke about infrared. I mean, this thing can be used pretty much as a universal remote for anything. It has an infrared receiver and transmitter. So you can actually um, record and save different transmissions from like your home remote or something. But there's built-in uh, universal remotes that you can use to like brute force TVs, ceiling fans, air conditioning units, uh, projectors, and different things like that. And that has a built-in dictionary in there, so that's pretty cool. So every manufacturer that has something that uses infrared has a specific pattern that they do to all their devices. But things like on and off for most devices is fairly universal. So what the flipper can do is just start rolling through those codes until you notice that the TV turned off. And then you can go, oh yeah, that was the one. It, maybe it has a timeout sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just rolls, just turn the TV off, and it'll just roll through every turn off code uh, for every manufacturer out there until the TV turns off. Uh, it used to be there was a watch back in the day that you'd buy in the 80s and 90s that did the same thing. Um, you know, love to annoy your, your family at Thanksgiving and just keep turning it off, and they're like, what the heck's going on? They don't realize you're punching your watch every five minutes. Um, we spoke about bad USB. A little bit about Wi-Fi too. So Wi-Fi is not built in. You need to have this uh, Wi-Fi dev board that comes with the ESP32. Um, let's see. What was interesting to say about Wi-Fi? There's another cool thing you can do. Uh, there's actually a, a Wi-Fi deauthor watch. Now that you brought up the uh, you can buy it on Amazon watch. watch. Like yeah, bucks. and you can just start kicking people off the Wi-Fi. You just walk around with it on. It's pretty cool. And I think that's based on the ESP8266, which yeah. is an earlier version of the ESP32. Um, but yeah, it does deauth attacks. I don't think it does key capture. It doesn't have any way to store no. any info. Um, I have a tool which, unfortunately, I didn't bring today, despite the fact that I brought lots of toys, um, called Konigachi, that is based off of Raspberry <laughs> Pi, that also does the same thing, except they can work together, and mine has Pikachu faces on it, so it's really cute <laughs> while it's breaking the Wi-Fi. Because Pikachu makes everything better. He can't be bad, it's Pikachu. Come on. Let's see what, we also got NFC. I actually was able to, he's got some cards here, but I was actually able to clone my hotel card so now I can use my flipper to get into my hotel room as well. So don't leave that laying around places. Yeah, and there are, there have been cases, I've worked a couple as a forensics, in, a digital forensics investigator where people have cloned people's cards and gotten into their rooms. So yes, you know, just like your car keys, be aware of 
where they're sitting and where they are. Now, if you're extra mischievous like me, and you have a device that you can actually be five feet away from them and clone that key, they're probably a little more advanced, but there's not many of those people running around, thankfully. Yeah, and a lot of these things we're talking about, I mean, you can, we can do all these cool things with this device here. We're professionals. But, <laughs> but for, for these like NFC cards and stuff, there are protections available to protect against us using this little device to clone these things and whatnot. The problem is that there are a lot of like people that are just they don't care, and there's not enough like people talking about this to really get them to fix these security vulnerabilities. So I think that's one of the really great things about this flipper is that you know people are talking about banning the device; it's so dangerous, blah blah blah. No, it's like there's nothing special in here. The special part about it is it's all in this small package that's easy and fun to use, right? Like we need people to know that some of these vulnerabilities exist and that they need to be fixed, and people should care about them because this stuff is prevalent everywhere. So the, the big trick to security, right? Any one system that one man invents, there are 150 plus people who are ready to break it and figure out how it works. The big joy in hacking is figuring out how it works. You want to take it apart. You want to figure out what it does. Like he does malware research. It pops up. I want to see what it does. I want to see how it, how it changes things. Um, I do malware research on the side. I'm not a pro like him, but it's I do it for fun. Um, the joy is understanding. It's scientific. You want to understand how it works, why it works. So when you hear someone say, I have a security system. It's totally secure. They lie to you. Because someone is going to figure out how that system works. Someone is going to break it and get a ton of joy in doing so because they're going to figure out what it does. So the big problem with security is there's no such thing as secure. You get a little more protection, but it comes down to are you protecting your key? Are you doing your due diligence enabling multi-factor? Are you making sure your passwords are secure? Are you making sure you're not storing all your stuff in one place digitally or even physically? Um, that's what this thing is for, is to encourage you to be curious about what's going on around you. For, for example, we're in a building. We can't see any of this Wi-Fi stuff or even the cellular signals around us. It's there. And this thing helps you sniff that stuff out. That's the fun of it. Yeah, and this, this stuff kind of bleeds into everything else as well. Like, I'm working at a cyber insurance company. Most of the claims and the way that these attackers get in are, are super simple vulnerabilities that have been around for so long, right? But people don't patch, people don't do the due, dil due diligence. And yeah, that's kind of, that's really what it comes down to. Please patch. Please. Can, can we have an example or two of like what in an insurance related situation would that, would, would be like the vulnerability you're talking about? Like what, what case example is that? Yeah, absolutely. So. I guess I'll give an example and then maybe you can talk about how the attacker would get in because yeah. that's kind of more your speed. Right? So RDP. Companies leave RDP <laughs> open <laughs> like, to the internet. R RDP? What, is, what does that mean? Uh, remote desktop remote program. program. Yeah. Okay. And you say Windows favorite. Okay. You do not want to. That is like the number one uh, risk signal that we use. That if you have that left open like to the public internet, your, your chance of having a claim skyrockets. So your price. Your premium with us will go really high, or we might just deny it. And in premium, in what area would would that be? Like automo automotive premium or cyber insurance? Cyber, 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 okay, yeah, this, okay, yeah, this okay. is okay. specifically for cyber okay, insurance. Okay. So we sell cyber insurance to companies. Okay. So yeah. hacking incidents cost money. Either downtime, you lose systems, something happens. Who pays for that? This guy's company. Got it. So if you're not doing your due diligence, now, now here's here's the trick. RDP is a useful tool, and it's an important tool. The problem is people misunderstanding how it's supposed to be used. I'll use a good example. Uh, what's TeamViewer. TeamViewer is a good example. It's a useful tool. People expose it to the internet, don't set a password. What do you think people go looking for? They go looking for exactly that. RDP is the same way. If you have a Windows Server collection, you got to have RDP. That's the only way you're going to get to that other than PowerShell. But where do you make sure RDP can't get out? Uh, do you have a, a bastion network where only the servers are in there and you have to VPN into that network to RDP to it? That's what you're supposed to do. 
No, no. I just need to get there, so I'm just going to stick it out the firewall and just have RDP explosive. <laughs> there you go. Problem solved. That's what usually happens. Yeah, that's what usually happens. Uh, SSH for Linux, which is secure shell, is kind of the same way. Uh, it's a little more secure because you can add things onto SSH to make it a little harder to break uh, that RDP doesn't have. But it's still something that, like, should you really expose it? You can set up things like VPNs to get to that in a secure fashion. Um, but that's that's work. I, I don't I don't want to do work. What makes a VPN more secure than SSH or RDP? So there's caveats. Good call out. Because what if your VPN's out of date? What if there's a vulnerability against that VPN? A good example is what happened to Colonial Pipeline. That's how they got in. There was an out-of-date VPN that nobody remembered it existed. It was just left on the network. Hackers found it and realized it was an out-of-date VPN because they managed to get information, uh, version information out of it, found a vulnerability that applied to it. They got a backdoor. Now, a properly set up VPN means that to the attacker's mindset, they can't see anything that, but that VPN connection listing waiting for someone to try to connect. That's a little harder if it's up to date, if that VPN has multi-factor enabled, if that VPN requires specific things on the laptop to be installed, like you can't connect if you don't have an antivirus, I won't let you connect. If you don't have a certificate from the enterprise saying you're supposed to be on this VPN, I won't let you connect. Um, the idea behind the VPN, for especially for enterprise systems like servers, is your admins should only need to get in there occasionally to do things. It should never have to be openly exposed where your management uh, protocols like RDP, SSH, and other things like that are just sitting on the internet waiting for someone to find. Mm -hmm. VPN means like, okay, I got to go talk to a server. I can get on VPN. VPN's going to check my antivirus. It's going to check my certificate. It's going to do, it's going to check multi-factor. That means something the attacker doesn't have or the attacker would have to go steal to get which raises the, the bar for the attacker to get it. Now, if you're mischievous like me, maybe you already got in their building and you have one of their laptops. Mm -hmm. And you have their login info because you fished that with an email early in the day. <clears throat> but that's hard to do. Because that means you physically broke into the building, you physically acquired that, you got someone to fall for a phishing email, which is getting harder because we're training you guys, hopefully, <laughs> on what phishing emails look like. But it still happens. So, so now if you have ChatGPT writing your phishing emails, it might be a little bit better. <laughs> if you see the emails start going into a bunch of racist rants, that's probably the phishing email. <laughs> but yeah, like he was kind of mentioning, you know, you might have the VPN and everything, but that's not really, you, you still need general security hygiene and practices. Like patching, patching cadence is something we're trying to take in right now as like an actual risk factor when we're trying to see how risky these companies are to insure them. Yeah, as our friend Shrek says, you know, security is layers like an onion. So that's what that was. And one thing that I don't when people talk about is the vulnerability with automotive like cars in the automotive industry, not just for theft, but actually manipulating the vehicle. Mm -hmm. How has and I know there was I believe there was some kind of like pushback with flipper people cloning people's car keys and stuff like that so you speak on that a little bit like oh yeah oh cars. yeah so i build cars and and i actually code car computers um because i've been saying um <laughs> so flip the big thing is security for car systems up until a couple years ago was non-existent yeah the idea that someone would break into can bus which is in most modern cars you have what is called can which is basically a twisted pair network that runs the length, has multiple controllers. There's usually one main controller, usually the ECU, or sometimes they have a CAN bus master controller that talks to everyone. But there, there, in most cases, no protections. Now, a couple of years ago, they started doing things like, manufacturers want to know what you're doing with your car. How hard are you pushing that engine? How often do you change your oil? But the problem is, if you're not thinking about who else can connect to that, then that means they can go see things about that CAN bus. What if they can send commands on that CAN bus? Turns out, you can. Uh, this already happened to Teslas. Uh, in fact, I think they did a DEF CON, was it two years ago, three years ago? They brought a Tesla in and demonstrated that you could force thing, that thing to do things like you could maybe tell it to accelerate, tell it to brake, because 
all of almost everything on your engine computer now is digital. Yep. Your throttle is digital. Your brakes might be connected to the brake master cylinder, but you can digitally brake that. Like my car has a hill hold feature. You can tell it digitally, hold the brake. What well, if you're going down the road and says, hey, hold the brake while you're going 95? <laughs> Cruise control is the adaptive cruise control. Steering is also. You think about all these advanced technologies they're putting in your car. They're not bad things. That's that's a trick. None of these are bad things, but did they think about the protections needed to make sure someone else can do that? CAN buses in most cases don't have any authentication. There's nothing to stop them from if you can find what the over-the-air radio is talking on, which is usually just a cellular device, and in most cases, if it's on a cellular device, it means it's on an IP network, which means it shows up as a server somewhere that somebody, if you ever want to see how cool this is, go check at shodan.io. <laughs> you can see all this stuff. It gets cataloged by attackers. And then they come through and figure out, hey, look, this is running some sort of microcontroller. It's got version information on it. It hasn't been patched. Oh, that's a car. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's the president's car. That's even cooler. <laughs> what can I do to that thing? I, I want to kind of get back to the social aspect, right? Because like you mentioned, like people have been overall flipping out about Flipper. And this reminds me, of, um, in some ways, in some parallels, back in the early days of the internet. We didn't have HTTPS. We used HTTP for everything. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until like with online banking and everything else, people were like, hey, everything's getting intercepted. Now we have to do something about mm -hmm. it. How much of the overall interaction is simply, uh, maybe maybe not let me phrase it that way, but I, I wonder if a lot of the uh, pushback and reaction to it is because of how people don't necessarily understand the number of different technologies that are running across the airwaves like you guys were talking about earlier. And so when you start showing that, all of a sudden you can see all the radio waves in this room and you're like, holy crap, there's so much. Yeah, and people it's information going, overload. Hey, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's like fear, you know, like one, like this stuff is there, and we're all living with it. But once somebody puts it in your face, you're like, that's scary. I don't like that. We should, we should get rid of this device, you know, like that's what's causing it all. Meanwhile, it's not. It's really it's, just exactly. bringing it it's to our awareness. It's not cause of it. It's yeah. just de it, it, it's illuminating it. A, exactly. A good example, and this kind of gets in a weird direction. So I, I, I shoot rifles, and I 3D print a lot of things. The question came up. How do we effectively ban someone from manufacturing a weapon at home if they have a 3D printer? That's really hard to do. Because technically, I also have a lathe and a mill. Right. I can manufacture practically anything if I, if I put my mind to it. It's the same thing with this. If you have the electronics and you do a little bit of book learning, you will figure out how radios work. Software-defined radios are the norm now. So if someone can figure that out, how is banning this really going to help. It's understanding, well, okay, not ban it. What do we do to protect against what this can do? Layers of authentication, social understanding, enforcing things that manufacturers have. to do, like authentication for a CAN bus and stuff like that. Uh, making sure, I think it was Hyundai, where they all had the same key on yep. every car and someone yep. found yep. the key on <laughs> a published document. Like, because that's smart. Like, yes, like, here's my house key. Like it's the 20, same as every key for, for every house out there. Like, But but that, again, sort of raises the, or confirms the point that it's not necessarily the technology, but it's the people running the technology that are the real vulnerabilities, right? Let's, let's be honest, right? I'm a company. I manufacture a product. Do I want to spend the extra 500 grand to a million dollars to secure this? Or would I rather just gamble on that nothing ever happens? Uh, that bean counter over there says, I shouldn't, I shouldn't worry about it. Hey, we got cybersecurity insurance. <laughs> They'll take care of this. Cybersecurity insurance. Go to our competitors. And you don't like <laughs> <laughs> we do not want our name associated. Uh, but but that's a trick. These guys are actually doing the right thing and going, hey, yeah, yeah, we'll insure you. 
are you doing the right things? Are you doing the basics even right? Like, uh, what I do as a pen tester is I go in and I break into things, <coughs> plant some flags, and then write a really long report that I hate doing because it's like a book report. And I go to them and say, you need to fix this, this, and this, and here's how you can do it. It's really easy. I'm going to show you what you need to fix. Turn on multi-factor. Take away all their admin rights. Stop giving everyone domain admin because you're a moron. Um, <laughs> but then the company has to decide whether they're going to spend the manpower to follow what that audit says. The audit from these guys or the audit from me. In most cases, they ball it up and toss it. Now, the, the, thanks for the report. We checked the box for PCI or whatever. We got a pen test done, so we're good. We don't have to do anything. You know, the insurance told us we should stop putting RDP outside the net. We're, okay, cool. We'll, we'll consider that in the future. Six months later, oh my god, we've been attacked. It's awful. Please help us. Cool. Let's see how the attackers got in. I'm, I'm now a digital forensics guy. I'm going to go, hey, what'd they do? Oh, look, here's logs. They got in through RDP. Hey, look, there's a finding on a report that I wrote for you <laughs> that said fix this. As okay. long as you get paid, right? I get paid. I'm happy. All right. <laughs> but like, at the end of the day, uh, not to be mean, I got paid. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not here to like be the hero. I just told you what to fix. And this guy told you, hey, if you want to get paid out, your, your insurance, you should probably fix that. Yeah, oftentimes, uh, when we give a policyholder a quote, there'll be a contingency attached. So it'll be like, okay, for you to, for us to bind this policy, you have to go, you have to enable uh, MFA on on all these devices or all, all these assets or things like that. You have to take down RDP, right, or put it behind a VPN. <laughs> for the love of God, please. <laughs> and luckily, oftentimes, like, kind of with that power of the policy, you can actually get them to, like, make some changes, which is really nice. And also, I mean, the more secure um, these people are, the lower their premium is going to be, right? So there's a financial motivator now, too. Yeah, the, the other thing is, like, uh, companies don't want to spend money to fix it, but at the same time, if you can show them you have a ransomware happen, maybe that ransomware doesn't spread as far. Maybe it doesn't hurt you as much. So you can, that payout, you, you won't need to use it as much. And how quickly can you get back up and running if you do get hit by ransomware? It's right? going to happen. You're going to get hacked. Because like you mentioned before, nothing is totally secure. Basically what you want to do is get secure enough that it's not worth the attacker's time to like get you, right? But if they do, how do you have backups, right? Are so they offline please and encrypted? Like, have you tested them? How quick can you get back up and running? Thank you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, test them, definitely. If you're taking backups and you ain't testing them, you don't have backups. Exactly. You have files. Yes. <laughs> With the insurance policy and stuff, how often do companies usually? I work for I work for a group. Um, I work for a business that falls under major business. I know. I believe this number is correct. We were told our premium or the amount we would have to pay if we had a problem is ten million dollars per incident. As I mean now. So we, I, we've done a lot of things you talked about. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is there time for the price that can go down, or is because we are we cover the whole state, so yeah, I mean, could we just be so big that that's why our number is so high, even if we're pretty good? I'm gonna I'm not gonna say I mean our people's prices do what fall. Mm -hmm. You know, I I yeah. shake my head every time the email alert comes up and something happens. So I mean, there's a lot of factors, right? Based on the company, what kind of information you have, how big you are, how many customers you serve. If you go down, how much money are you losing every day? That's why I was saying it's important, like, how quickly can you recover? If something does happen, right, because might, you might say, like, it's bound to happen eventually, how quickly can you get back up on your feet and going, like, without having to pay the ransom or something like that? Have you tested the backups and whatnot? To, to this guy's point, a good disaster recovery plan is essential to every security plan. You should assume we're going to get hit eventually. How have we put in controls to mitigate how big that hit will be? And how quickly can we come back online? Do we have hardware stashed away? Do we have a cloud set up that we can quickly spin up? Do we have the data we need to do that? So a, a disaster recovery plan is just as important as all the antivirus and firewalls in the world. Yeah, and I would honestly argue that cyber insurance is part of that strategy as well. 
you know, like we're we'll be there. We have a a. Um, you can hire people with money. Yeah, no, we have we have like an incident response team that'll actually help you. And if we if they're like can't help you for some reason, they'll they will give you to somebody that can, and we'll be there to, to be the first responders, kind of, because obviously you know you can't call the police in situations like this. Yeah. But um, combining like the help we can do, the ways we can try and make you more secure, and then obviously the money that goes along with it, that, that's part of a comprehensive security plan as well. If, uh, if you have a question, can you come up to the mic? We're, we're just trying to make sure we capture your question too. Oh, it, it's yeah. fine if you don't want to. Getting back to the flipper, how often are you changing ROMs, flashing ROMs, or you can have a bunch of them on there at one time and switch between them, how does that work? Um, so there's a couple different custom firmwares that add various features, like uh, Flipper comes with a cute little face on it. Maybe you don't give a crap about that, you just want to do the tool stuff. Uh, you can rewrite that. There's some things that add radio features, scanning features that are not built in. There is a massive amount of support on GitHub of all sorts of different firmwares. I don't change mine that often because I don't use it on the job all that often because I either have very expensive tools or I manufacture my own tools to do so. Um, I know yeah. That, yeah, there is also like Discord communities as well, where you can get a lot of support on these things. But um, yeah, right on mine, I have something called Rogue Master running, which is pretty cool. It gives you a bunch of extra features and changes the dolphin as well. <laughs> You're into that. So um, if you are doing, if you're trying to measure, let's say, a building's uh, RF signature, figure out what's coming out that could be you know, a vulnerability. Do you use something like a Flipper Zero or do you use more complex RF tools than that? You can <coughs> use a Flipper Zero if you have the, the, the Wi-Fi board on it, because like NFC and some of those radio features aren't going to cover the average thing your building's going to be emitting. You know, I actually have um, radio frequency me uh, measuring, I, I have spectrometers that like are pocket size that I can carry around. Uh, usually, so when you're doing pen tests, there's various things, you, steps you go through. You have a reconnaissance stage where sometimes I, if there's a coffee shop across the street, I go sit there. I'll have a camera recording who goes in, goes out. I'll have an RF spectrometer recording what sort of signals the building's emitting, what sort of access points are hanging around. Is there access points that come online or come offline? Because some companies do do that. Uh, are there things being emitted by, sometimes the HVAC system might have a wireless maintenance system that pops up. Um, sometimes if I can't do that, I'll walk around the building as subtly as I can so that no one knows there's a dork walking around measuring the RF signal coming out of their building, <laughs> like me. Um, and then I'll go home and review that and kind of create a plan of action based on the signals and access points I saw. Because some of the other things I need to know, um, who made the access points? What firmware are they running? Uh, what sort of interrogations do they give when I try to connect? Uh, I've scripted my Ponagachi, which is built more for, it kind of does the same thing as this, but Wi-Fi focused, mm -hmm. uh, to try to connect and then capture the sort of handshakes and information. Because one of the things that's going to exchange, hi, I'm this sort of access point. I'm manufactured by this guy. Here's my MAC address, and I'll give you all the information about what it is. Here's what I need to know from you to enable the connection. Because you don't have to actually have the password to start the handshake that comes in halfway through the handshake so you can kind of try to do the handshake beforehand um, but generally especially for what we're what I'm doing I'm trying to get a network connection so I'm looking for access points specifically Bluetooth might be useful and sometimes you get printers that they have their own Wi-Fi and they're plugged into their network and I can jump on the printer and then jump onto their network, which they did a DEF CON panel where they did that live and it was hilarious. Because in most cases, there's nothing stopping you connecting to HP underscore print jet uh, that is connected to their network on the management network because so-and-so really had to print at that moment and didn't want to go downstairs to the actual printer. The biggest print, uh, the biggest fish tank yeah, yeah. The, uh, he's talking about, so they had a fish tank at Vegas that had a Wi-Fi enabled temperature controller for the fish tank. I think it did like health of the fish tank too. It was connected to their network. And yeah, they connected to it and then got on the network through the fish tank. Hacking fish, Flipper applies here. because <laughs> 
so if I wanted to write my own firmware, is there like a software development kit? Uh, okay, yeah. There's like documentation on the Flipper website actually. Wonderful. Okay. You they'll that. tell you all the modules yeah. you got to pull in. Uh, they'll even give you the, the base layer and say here's the basics you have to have. Uh, and the nice thing is if you screw it up, don't worry. Flipper has a really robust uh, recovery mode. So if you actually flash it wrong, and most chips do this nowadays, there's the chip has a built-in recovery mode where you can basically start it from scratch as if nothing was on it. Okay, so, um, so, so like there's a bootloader on it and there's like two banks or something? No, like. most chips just have that built in now. There's not even, oh, there's okay. a bootloader that's for flashing the chip. Like, you know, with your phone, like, oh no, my phone's really screwed up, I need to do a factory reset. A lot of chips have that now, where right. you can factory reset the chip without having any of the prior code that was on there at the time. Okay. So yeah, don't don't be afraid of breaking it. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm new to this. I just got it this year. Uh, my wife wants all the amiibo codes for near field communication, <laughs> and how do I get that onto my flipper? <laughs> Pretty easy. Uh, so on, if you go to the Flipper main menu, I think the Amiibos use the NFC. NFC, yeah. They yeah. You, so you go to the NFC, and it's the same way this guy works. You scan it. It'll ask you if you a, after it successfully captures it, uh -huh. you can scroll over and you can save it. And then once you've saved it, you can go to the saved menu on that, and you can replay whatever the last one was. I saw they had on GitHub. You can go ahead and get them all in a file. Yes. Yeah. How do you get that on there? <laughs> so I think it's, it's a file that you load up onto the SD card. So you just load it through the SD card? Yeah, and, and then you can just scroll to it. So you format the SD card in the flipper, uh -huh. and then you uh, and then you just read that file, and it, you can just scroll through and select which uh, amiibos you want to replay. Because my wife did the same thing. Uh -huh. Except I, ended, I got so tired of her stealing it that I ended up making her a little NFC thing with a with a Arduino that's like, here, it has a screen. Just scroll on it, whichever Amiibo you want, just use. And I, I got one other question. So with scripting, can you put a wait on it? And let yes. it wait a couple hours before it runs the script? And does it have to be plugged into the computer while it does that? No. Or does it stay on there? It'll stay on there. OK. So it loads it, it on the SD what's card. What's this for? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind, never mind. Yeah. Oh, that was just a cool feature. <laughs> yeah, so, like, the Amiibos have a timeout. Like, you can only scan them so, so often uh, because, you know, they'll give you something in Zelda and you get some extra resources. Or right. maybe you get a Mario hat. Uh, but it has, like, a like, timeout, so you can set, like, you can only use Look it. Look at the sleeve. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's all my questions. Thank you. <laughs> Decentralized office infrastructure is pretty much here to stay. Remote work. We're not going back. What, what are the, the trade-offs, pros and cons, in terms of improving or decreasing corporate infrastructure security? That's a really good question. You got this one. Yeah, um, so, so the reality is there's two things. I'd actually say there's two things that are going to be what here was to stay. The question? Uh, he asked decentralized work, like you're working from home, right? Maybe you're using your own computer work from home. Um, BYOD. Uh, how do you secure that? Well, there's multiple different ways. You can set up virtual desktops where they, they just use a virtual desktop that's in like Azure or Google Cloud or something, and that has like a Windows image or something that they do all their work in. Uh, in some cases, most of their applications are using, like I know a lot of our developers, are all software as a service. You go to github.com and upload your code. You go to Azure to do all your, like, all your emails and all your Teams work. Uh, it really comes down to, is there anything on your computer that you really need to do your work? Uh, in most cases, most workers, probably not. You, you don't need anything to do your work. That's kind of the funny thing where you hear all these guys like, you need to be in the office. It's like, what, so you can watch me? That's about yes. it. That's all you're yes. getting from me. Mm -hmm. Like, especially for me, where it's like, I'm going to go break into the store down the street. Do you really want to watch me? Come on, let's go. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it, it, it's like, hey, we need to see you in the office. I mean, fine, I'm OK with that. But what is there in the office that I can't do at home? And if you're really measuring me by whether I'm visible, or whether I'm returning value in actually actual reports and things that we're fixing, tells me what sort of manager you are. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, and the big things around securing that, multi-factor. 
stopping stupid password rotations because honestly those are one of the worst things in the world like in fact the recommendation by Microsoft NIST and the NSA is you shouldn't be doing password rotations however you should be driving really long passphrases so I'm sorry you're gonna have to learn a password that's 20 plus characters however it won't change unless you actually get a breach so it'll actually make your life easier because maybe you have to type in a long password but you only have to type in that password and don't have to change it every 90 days Chant password rotations are actually proven to create less secure passwords. Because yep. you're doing summer 2014. Okay, it's winter. It's winter 2014. Oh, it's spring 2014. Because I don't want to keep changing these stupid passwords. Let me write down this version. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to write this down and put on a sticky note. By the way, that sticky note is going to be out there in the, the entrance so everyone can see it as they pass by. Because, or, or in your home office. Yeah, your home office so, so my cat can steal it and then give it to the neighbor. Uh, in the promo photos in the brochure. Yep, yep. Oh, well, the, those are my favorite where it's like, I, I walked into it, I did a pen test for a client where they have like a photo of like someone working at their office, like look how good Bob's doing. Bob's password was in the photo, <laughs> on the screen, in their entrance. And I'm like, cool, that, that's great. Click. Yep. Oh, I'm that. done. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, uh, the, a lot of security is, we do all these stupid little things that actually make us less secure because we think they make us secure. And, and that's really what's, what remote work, that's about what securing remote work is about, is how do we do things, make it easier for remote workers by not making their lives hell, by ma making them like multi-factor, giving them the tools to secure themselves. Half the time it's like, did you even give them what they needed to secure themselves? Password no. manager, single yeah. sign-on, things like that. Yeah. Oh no, you made it hell. So of course they couldn't secure, so they couldn't help you be secure because you made it worse for them. You're the problem, not the, a good example, I, I work in application security, I, I work with developers like him, where it's like, hey, they've got all these vulnerabilities, are we, are we teaching them how not to make vulnerabilities? Oh, we're not. So it's not really their fault. It's all, we failed. We failed because we didn't help them. So and having to explain to management, it's like, no, guess what? You guys screwed up. Not the developer. You guys screwed up because you didn't show them how to do it right. Or you didn't give them the tools to do it right. You didn't want to spend the money to do it right. It's your fault. We get security theater. Yep. What's up, man? Hey, uh, something that I keep wondering every time it comes up, the, the, the Wi-Fi, the deauth packets, mm -hmm. uh, what's a legitimate use case for that? Why does it exist? And how often does it happen naturally? Would it be useful to log deauth packets to know if someone's trying to reach you? Well, I think part of it is if somebody were to be on your network, you could use it to kick them off as well. But, uh, so there are some features, I, I know Cisco does some functionality in there, so most of their access points are managed from a single point. You have a controller somewhere. I use Ubiquity at home, there's a single controller. You can log someone who is frequently getting kicked off the network, and it'll give you some information. The problem is, you generally don't see what's de-authing them, because it's not actually going to the access point. But you can see the frequent hop. Now the, the reason de-auth exists is because there's a real functionality. You're walking around in a big building like this. You've got an office the size of this hotel. So-and-so C-suite guy, he's connected to access point. He doesn't want to have to connect to the access point every time. So you have what's called roaming. The access points talk to each other through the controller and say, hey, this laptop is losing signal. He's going to have to jump to another access point here in a sec. I need you to deauthorize him. And then when he gets close to you, capture him and reconnect him to the network so it's seamless so he doesn't see it. That's where DOC came from. The functionality of that act, of that laptop moving through the building, it has to DOC. The one access point has to say, stop connecting to me, but there's a guy with a different MAC address that's coming up ahead. Connect to him. So you have to tell him, get off my network. But if you're a device that's saying, hey, no, DOC from this guy, the access point is go, hang on, hang on. No, you still have an active session. Come back. I, I need you to get back in the network. No, come back, come back, please please keep coming back. And then it's spamming out tough pieces of the hash to kind of say, hey, come back, please please come back, or the laptop is sending the hash back saying, yeah, I'm authorized to be here, don't get rid of me, please allow me to stay. So 
that's where we got a lot of this DF. There was legit reason for it, which was to allow roaming and other things. Uh, especially when you had access points that only had a single radio. Uh, you had like a cheap Linksys back in the day, and you got 500 devices because your kid decided to get every Wi-Fi enabled thing at Toys R Us. Um, <laughs> it's knocking everyone else off the network. But those devices got to come back on the network. They still want to connect. So they, they got to reauthorize, and you don't want to have to, oh, I got my password in again. No, I got a session. Just let me back in. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. Would, <coughs> would it make any sense to log that? It, it does a, if, your controller, on it, it, if your controller supports it. But in many cases, it's a matter of what can I change here? What can I, what can I do? Uh, maybe you have some session data and you can kind of alert on that. But the problem with most networks in general is they're alerting for everything under the sun. Yeah. Like, app, ah, we got too many clients. App, ah, we got too many connections. App, ah. And so it, you get eventually just this, they get tired of seeing it, so they stop making alerts. So you can make alerts for that, but can you address it? And can you understand where the attacker is? You probably can't because you can't see him. And you can't hunt down his DOF signals without having some fairly advanced equipment to hunt him down. Yeah, uh, well, can you do, do RDF, I assume. You kind of, yeah, uh, you, you can to a degree, but it's still, it's like, what if the guy's across the street? I'm going to march out there as the network admin and be like, get in here, get out and everything, you suck, get in my office. But just knowing that you're, someone's attacking you can let you have some kind of response. Again, what would your response be? Tell someone so that, yeah. It, it, that's the kind of hard part is it's like there's certain packs that's like, yeah, I know what's going on, but what am I going to do? I'm aware now, that's good. Um, is there things we can do to address it? Maybe up upgrade to a certificate base so we don't have to worry about having a pre-shared key? Uh, that might help. There, there's, that's, that's a thing like he talked about earlier. It's like there are technologies that are made to address this, but most companies are going to go, oh, that costs 20000 more? I don't want to spend on that this year. No, that's not in the budget. We're just going to do pre-shared key WPA2 because that's cheap. So there we go. Uh, I have been trying to get one of these devices for a while. They've always been sold out, so I just got one a couple weeks ago. I haven't had a chance to play with it, so I don't have a serious question. But uh, the most important question of any piece of hardware, can it play Doom? <laughs> they, got Doom they got Doom playing on a, on a pregnancy test kit. It's not really working. I know, I know. It still was there. He's <laughs> <laughs> got two on it. At least hey, download the road it back has a D-pad. You can play Doom on this. It has enough guts. You're gonna play Doom. You can play Doom with 16 rat brain cells. Yeah. <laughs> it has an ISA. It can run Doom. Yeah. 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 And basically, at this point, every microcontroller on Earth has enough power to run Doom. Uh, I can't think of a single one. Your LED light bulb has enough CPU power to run it. Like, that's, that's how great, like, if I was a kid, holy crap, this stuff, I'd be like, oh my god, this has Linux on it? And it fits in my, I can hold this? It's not a gigantic tower sitting under my table? This is the coolest thing on earth? And then tell them, yeah, by the way, you can get Linux running on something that's the size of a postage stamp. And it has more than one core. And it has enough memory that you can actually run services on it. A little kid me be like, I love the future. This is great. <laughs> hey, I'm not sure if you covered this while I was out of the room, but I, I just wanted to ask, uh, are people using Flipper on uh, pen test engagements? Yep. Yeah, I've seen a couple. Um, <coughs> Again, it gets into that problem is, like, I know I can use it in my office. However, not every RFID reader, not the card, but the reader itself, will listen to the signals coming from that. Um, a lot of cards, if you actually look on the back, there's a little, uh, there's a number, usually on the back of that card. Um, there's certain information that a lot of these readers look for that is not part of the signature that if this thing tries to send back, say, I'm this card number with this unique ID, it'll go, yeah, but 
by the way, when, when was this card manufactured or who manufactured it? Oh, you don't have that info? I'm not going to listen to you. Um, especially active readers are probably the biggest issue. Like, um, if you have like the security gates at your office where you scan your card and the gates open, mm -hmm. I've noticed those don't like talking to Flipper. However, the little badge readers on the door are pretty dumb, and they will generally talk to Flipper. Um, I have I have a couple pen testing friends where they they have used it in the field. Um, they've cloned people's keys. Uh, usually just because they haven't bought a Proxmox yet and they're not addicted to very expensive hacking hardware yet. Um, which I can't blame them because that stuff is pricey. Um, because they know you make a lot of money off it. Um, but yeah, I've seen people clone badges. I've seen people clo clone hotel room keys. I've seen people clone uh, access to garages. I've seen people clone garage door openers. Um, I, had, I, I can't really go into much detail, but I had a friend who had a flipper. And he sat outside the Target's uh, garage at the office and just basically sat there until the guy came by and captured his, uh, the, the door code because they didn't have one that had a rolling key. Um, to explain what that is, most garage door openers, modern ones, have what's called a rolling key. Your car probably has this too, where there's a preset known key that this guy knows and the controller in the car or the controller in the garage door opener knows. And every time you use that opener, it rotates the key to a different one. And if you don't know the pattern it's going to use, you can't know that key unless you just sit there and listen to it over and over and over again, which you can do, but it goes into that, do you have the time? You're an attacker. You need to get in there now. Do you have the time to wait for them to just repeatedly press the button? Probably not. And you probably don't have the time to wait days for them to actually go through all the rolling codes before it starts cycling back. Um, it gets it more into that idea of security is about delaying and alerting. How quickly, how long can you delay them? Someone's trying to break into your house. They're trying to get in your door. If they're using lockpicks, that takes time. They could just break your glass and go in your house if they really want to, but if they're an attacker that actually cares, mm -hmm. they probably don't want to do that because that alerts you that they're there. If they don't want you alerted, they're going to take their they're they're going to try to get in a quieter way. Hackers do the same thing. Uh, if I blow up all the tools I have on your network, you guys are going to find me fast. And sometimes I do that just to see if they will find me. Like, hey, I'm doing everything under the sun. Do you see me? But if I get in a network where I, I, I've done proper reconnaissance, I, I, I might not want them to find me yet. I need to be quiet. That's hard to do. That means time and effort for me to establish a presence and recon the network and listen for all the connections and see what's going on. I kind of went off on a tangent because I'm full of ADHD, but you get the idea. <laughs> Okay, are, are there any other final questions? We can run a little bit late because this is the last one of the night, but any final questions? After this, this guy's going in. Hi, uh, sorry, this isn't specifically about Flipper, but you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, panel that part of what you did was physical pen testing. Mm -hmm. um, for that and rolling that into a career for general security. How do you get started in physical pen testing where somebody lets you bring into their building for money? Because uh, I would love to do something like that. I have no idea where to start in building that other than breaking into a building and then accidentally going to jail because of it. So. Uh, I won't lie, that's practically how I started. Um, uh, uh, there are companies who will, if, if you go get like, we're both studying for our uh, OSCP. Um, if you get that, there are companies who will hire you and then train you on how to do it. Um, where then you'll go out in the field, you do engagements. Uh, I've actually, I wanted to do some engagements I don't normally get, so I actually went as a contractor with one company where we did uh, a power company. We broke into a transformer station. Oh, very cool. um, and so you get some hands-on experience saying like, hey, I already do these pen testing engagements. But if you get the digital portion down, the physical portion kind of comes easy. Because it's like, hey, I, 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 I'm doing the digital stuff. I really want to do this. You can go to your company and say, there's training courses that you can go attend. And they will teach you lock picking, how to, uh, they'll teach you basically how to be a spy. Like, here's how to check what's around you. Here's how to do reconnaissance. 
here's how to play dress up. If there's one thing I love about Dragon Con and Awa Con, because I'm a huge anime nerd and I love seeing people dress up, is that is a valuable skill in doing penetration testing. I have disguises. I dress up as a pest inspector. I dress up as, a, I've dressed up as county employees. <laughs> and if they don't ask me, half the time they just go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. you're the pest guy, you've got the spray bottle, you've got the, the jumper and everything. You can, I can even buy a badge off eBay, <laughs> like, you know, whatever pest control company is around. Or sometimes I've actually sat and waited and see who your pest company is. And, oh yeah, it's them. Okay, Terminix. Yeah, I'm going to go buy a badge from Terminix. Don't do that! <laughs> but, um, but if you look like you belong there, then it, of course... Most people... People want to trust people, and it's not a bad thing. This is why phishing emails work. We don't think of an email as, like, so-and-so wrote an email to me. We think, Bob! I know Bob! He's, he's sending me this document! I, I, I want to answer Bob. I want to help Bob. I want to be a good person. Bob's actually some guy in North Korea, and he set up an 0365 page for you to go pump your credentials in. Um, shame about that. But th this is the thing is, uh, I'm, as a f I went to school for physics, so I'm a huge fan of Carl Sagan. If you want to understand how to better understand the attacker mindset, learn Carl Sagan's guide to skepticism. Being skeptical yes. and understanding how these things work is how you go, okay, I got an email. This doesn't look normal. I'm going to go look at the URL. Yeah. Oh, look, this isn't going to like Outlook.com. This is going to some garbage. And you know, your skepticism meter starts to go up a little more. It's like, OK, this is looking fishy. Most people don't do that. And some phishing tests actually make this worse, where it's like, oh, you looked at the URL, saw our magic pixel, you, you failed your phishing test. It's like, cool. So you discourage them from doing the basics of, of like ensuring their safety. That, that was stupid. Um, Skepticism and only giving trust when you've understood what's going on. Uh, one of the engagements where I got caught, I was dressed up as a generic bank employee. The security guard asked all the right questions. Hey, I said, hey, I forgot my badge. I need to get in. It's on my desk. He asked me, cool, who's your manager? Who do, who do you work for? What do you do? What department are you? But for every one guy, who asked the right questions, I 